Hi, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech, and in this video I'm just going to do a very brief, the briefest, of reviews of complex numbers. So to get started, let's just say that we have a complex number that looks like this. Sigma plus j omega, where sigma and omega are constants. We call this the rectangular form. The polar form of this same complex number looks like this. It's the magnitude times e to the j phi. And that is equal to omega squared plus sigma squared square root, which is the magnitude, times e to the j phi. And again, that n is the magnitude and phi is the phase angle. And we'll take a little bit closer look at this phase angle in just a second here. Um, the way to do that is to take your complex number and plot it in the real and imaginary complex plane. So let's see, sigma was the real part, so let's say that's here. There's our complex number, by the way. And omega is the imaginary part, so let's say that's here. So there's omega, there's sigma. And this distance is n, and this angle is phi, the phase angle. So now we can see that phi is equal to the inverse tangent of omega over sigma the imaginary part over the real part. Now, the next thing we'll do is, let me go down a page, is look at Euler's identity. It's a wonderful thing. Um, so if we look at our complex number in polar form, we can also express it in rectangular form like so, cosine phi plus j sine phi. So in this representation we can see that our real part of the complex number is cosine phi times n and the imaginary part of the complex number is sine phi times n. A couple useful results that pop out of Euler's identity and these are extremely useful, are that sine phi is equal to e to the j phi minus e to the negative j phi divided by 2j, and cosine phi is similar, but a little bit different. The denominator is just 2, not 2j, and the sine is plus instead of minus. And that's really the main uh, theoretical, if you want to call it that, uh, aspect that we're going to look at. Now we'll just go through a couple examples. Let's say that you had a complex number that was some P1 is equal to 3.1 minus 5.9J. So it's in rectangular form. So go ahead and compute the magnitude and phase of this. Basically put it into polar form. So the magnitude of P is equal to the square root of 3.1 squared plus 5.9 squared. And the phase angle of phi is the inverse tangent of the imaginary part over the real part. Now when you're doing this sort of thing, it's often very helpful to visualize your complex number in the complex plane. So this one has a real part that's positive and an imaginary part that's negative, so it's down here like so. So you could represent that phase angle in a couple of ways. Um, you could represent it like this, or you could represent it like that. You just got to 
make sure that you have the sine set properly. So depending on how you go about calculating inverse tangents, sometimes you might need to take into consideration what quadrant that complex number is in. So just be mindful of that. Similarly, if we try another example, and let's say we have P2 is equal to just some number like so. So now we have a complex number in, in polar coordinates and let's go ahead and put it into rectangular. So we take our magnitude, stuff it right here, and then we take the phase angle which is here, negative 3.82, and we'd go cosine negative 0.382 minus, actually, I could just say cosine 0.382 minus j, oops, sine of 0.382. And I'm done. So now let's do one more example and we'll exercise some of what we had from Euler's identity. So let's go ahead and prove that sine squared of omega t is equal to, so here's an identity that you probably stumbled upon in high school, cosine 2 omega t, 1 minus cosine 2 omega t. So to do that, we'll just take this sine squared and express it using our complex form. So we have sine squared omega t is equal to e to the j omega t minus e to the negative j omega t over 2j times itself. And what we'll do is, so we'll just go through this algebra and then see if we can express what we get into this form. So if I multiply things out, let's do the denominator first. I will get uh, negative one-fourth from the denominator. And now let's focus in on the numerator. e to the j omega t times e to the j omega t. So that's e to the 2 j omega t. And if I do the outside terms, I'll have e to the j omega t times e to the negative j omega t with a negative sign in front of it. So there I'll get e to the 0 with a negative sign in front of it. If I do the inside terms, um, I'll get a ne another negative 1. And finally, the last term, I'll get a plus e to the negative 2 j omega t. Great. Um, so now let's try to rewrite this a little bit. Uh, Let's see, what shall we do? How about if we break this up into two pieces? Because when I look at this, I can see that I have two pieces. I also see that I have a one-half out in front. So I'll make this a one-half, and I'll bring a part of that one-half inside the square brackets. So I'll have negative e to the 2j omega t minus e to the negative 2j omega t. Don't forget that half. And I'll have plus, combining these two things, 2 over 2, so I'll get a 1. And again, i am got to make sure I keep track of that negative sign. If I bring all this together, I get 1 half. This, from our Euler's identity results, is actually oops, and I left off at 2 right there, is actually cosine 2 omega t with a minus sign in front of it because I have two minus signs there, plus 1, which is exactly what we have right here. So one of the interesting aspects of these ways of repre representing sine omega t and cosine omega t is that you can easily and quickly prove many, many trig identities that you may have just memorized in the past. And this can be quite helpful uh, for working with Laplace transformed quantities that we'll be studying in the future. So
So again, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech, and thanks for watching.